Love the story about the little girl who was drawing a picture in her kindergarten class. Teacher asked her what she was drawing. She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Teacher smiled and said, sweetie, no one knows what God looks like. She smiled back and said, they will as soon as I'm done. <laughs> now, I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but we are hoping that over the next 13 weeks, we would paint a picture of who God is and the story that he has been writing since time before time. Now, it's really more like a connect the dots. That was my genre of art as a kid, okay? Because I can't even draw a stick figure, but I can count. And uh, do you remember these things? You know, you just follow the numbers, and at first you really have no idea what you're drawing, but you, you get a little ways into it, and sure enough, a picture emerges. Now, there's a fancy theological word for that. It's called progressive revelation. God, throughout Scripture, dot by dot, story by story, book by book, reveals himself. Now, in Genesis 1-1, all we know is that God is a powerful creator. But come on, by the time we get to the back of the book, there are more than 400 names for God in Scripture. So in 13 weeks, uh, we're really just going to scratch the surface, but we're going to give you a connect the dot puzzle. Now, uh, the Bible is an amazing book. It's a big book. It's a big book, right? Um, let me just say a few things, because this is, it's not a rule book. It's a story book. It's a story of God. And uh, I want to give you just a little Backdrop. It was written by 40 authors on three continents and three languages over 15 centuries. But here's what's unique about the Bible. It claims to be inspired by God. And I don't want to just brush right past that. And I want to go on record as saying I, I believe that. Um, I've read about 4,000 books on about every subject under the sun. You know, I love to read. I love books. But I'm going to tell you something this weekend. This book is in a category by itself. I'm going to tell you why. It's because it's living and active in the words of Hebrews 4. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrates to even dividing soul and spirit, uh, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Here's what I'm saying. You don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads you. And so there were over 40 human authors. They range from farmers to fishermen, poets and prophets, kings and generals, written in caves and palaces and prisons. Touches on hundreds of controversial topics. It's filled with history that can be historically verified. It's filled with science that can be scientifically certified. It is a book with every subject matter on it, from law to history to poetry to prophecy, gospels, epistles, and an apocalyptic ending. The amazing thing to me, all those authors, all those subjects, all those years, yet it reads like one story from beginning to end. And here's why. There's one author. The same spirit who inspired those writers to write inspires readers as they read. And that's what makes the Bible such a unique book. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, every word of Scripture has 70 faces and 600,000 meanings. In other words, you, you never get to the bottom of this book. But we're not going to put it under a microscope in this series as much as we're going to look through a telescope. And so we'll go from Genesis to Revelation. You've got a reading plan. Um, now, now, the Bible, 66 books and uh, 773,692 words. But who's counting, right? Uh, it is a big book, and we want to do a flyover, and here's why. 
And if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down uh, in your journal. Text without context is pretext. It is the most basic principle of hermeneutics, the science of interpreting Scripture. You interpret Scripture with Scripture. And if you don't know the whole story, then it's hard to put it into context. Let me give you one little example, okay? Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about the Exodus and, and, and probably about the, the Passover. If you don't have an Old Testament understanding of the Passover, okay, the, the Exodus out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, then you tell me, are you going to have a full appreciation of Jesus as the Passover lamb in the New Testament? And for that matter, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, it was a Passover meal. And that's just one small example. I think a lot of people employ a pick and choose approach uh, to the Bible or a flip and point method, right? It's like the guy who was looking for some inspiration uh, flipped open his Bible to a verse pointed and uh, came to the verse that said Judas went and hung himself. Well, that's not very inspiring, so he tried it again. Next verse, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> we want to take a less haphazard, a more consequential approach to the Bible, to the story of God during this series. Now, a few years ago, I attended a screenwriting seminar with Robert McKee. Uh, he's a screenwriting legend. His students have won 63 Academy Awards, 164 Emmy Awards. We spent two days talking about story structure, text and subtext, setup and payoff, beat and arc, conflict and resolution. But to me, the key to a great story is something called an inciting incident. It's the tipping point. It's the turning a point. It's the defining action or defining decision that changes the trajectory of a story. In a sense, what we're doing over the next 13 weeks is looking at 13 inciting incidents in the Bible. The creation, the promise, the exodus, the covenant, the conquest, the kingdom, the warning, the return, the coming, the rising, the mission, the church, and finally, the revelation, 13 inciting incidents. And our prayer is that this would be more than just a long story short. Listen, God wants to write his story through your life. But unless you understand the meta narrative, it's hard to understand where you fit and the role that God wants you to play in his story of redemption. And so with that, are you ready to do this thing? Okay, let's do it. Here we go. If you have a Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 1. I think you can find it. And uh, once you find it, why don't you stand as I read God's word. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning. The first day. And that's as far as we're going to get this week. I wish we could talk. Oh, love day three. <laughs> love day six. Day seven, too. But we're going to talk about day one. Why don't you grab a seat? Now, right now, you have no sensation of motion, especially if you're sitting in our incredibly comfortable theater seats at Boston or Kingstown or Gainesville or Potomac Yard, you have no sensation. It's a miracle you're even awake right now. <laughs> but the reality is you're on a planet that's spinning around its axis at about 1,000 miles 
per hour. It'll make one complete turn in the next 24 hours, and, and you don't even get dizzy. Now, not only that, we're on a planet that's speeding through space at 67,000 miles per hour. So even on a day when you feel like you didn't get much done, you did travel 1.3 million miles through space. And those speeds and those distances are tiny compared to our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, which is spinning at 490,000 miles per hour. And it's so big that it's going to take about 200,000 years to make a turn. Now, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you thanked God for keeping us in orbit? I'm guessing never. <laughs> Why? Because God is so good at what God does that we take it for granted. And I know people who say they've never experienced a miracle. With all due respect, I beg to differ. Now, as Albert Einstein, who said there are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle. And listen, that's an option. I can't prove the existence of God any more than you can disprove his non-existence, okay? It's a tenet of faith one way or the other. But Einstein said there is another way to live, and that's as if everything is a miracle, and that's how I live my life. Here's my point. We already trust God for the big miracles, like keeping us in orbit. Now we just need to trust him for the little miracles, everything else. I want to share just a couple simple thoughts this weekend. But I think they frame the story of God. And I think they're incredibly important at the very outset. Two thoughts. And so if you're taking notes, you can jot these down. Number one, God is bigger than big. Now, the theological word is transcendence. And God is closer than close. The theological word is imminence. And what we see in these very first verses of Genesis is a transcendent God and a imminent God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. Now, I'm going to give fair warning. Listen, Albert Einstein said that science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. I just, I'm not a person who's going to turn a blind eye to science. I love science. I think every ology is a branch of theology, and that could come across the wrong way. But Romans 1.20 says that since the creation of the world, God has revealed his divine nature through what he has made. And so when I'm studying the sciences, I feel like I'm <laughs> genetics. Do you know you have enough DNA strand to stretch from here to the moon and back? 10,000 times. Listen, give me a little genetics and my appreciation for the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made goes up a notch or two. And so fair warning, uh, there's no way to talk about the first couple of verses of Genesis without it feeling a little bit like a uh, science class. So here we go. Let there be light. In other words, uh, let there be electromagnetic radiation with varying wavelengths traveling at a speed of 186,281.7 miles per second. Let there be ultraviolet and infrared. Let there be gamma rays, x-rays, radio waves, and microwaves. And microwaves. <laughs> let there be photosynthesis and fiber optics. Let there be LASIK surgery and satellite communication. Let there be color and health and life and everything else. Let there be, light is the basis of everything. Four words, God speaks it into existence. And light has been defeating darkness at a rate of 186,000 miles per second ever since. Now the word said in English is the Hebrew word amar, and it can uh, be translated to challenge. I kind of like this. It's like God challenges the darkness. God challenges the emptiness with his voice. But the famous composer Leonard Bernstein said that the best translation of said 
and sang. Now, I might have a musical bias right here at play, okay, but I kind of like it. Creation is God's song. Creation is God's symphony. According to the, the science of bioacoustics, Millions of songs are being sung right now that we can't hear. And there's a reason why we can't hear them, because our range of hearing is between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Anything above and below is infrasonic or ultrasonic. And so we can't hear uh, whale songs that travel 4,000 miles underwater. We can't hear um, a metal lark has a range of 300 notes. Or, or what about earthworms? A super sensitive sound instruments have found that they have a faint staccato note that they sing. Now, Arnold Summerfield, the German physicist and pianist, uh, said that hydrogen atoms, which emit 100 frequencies, are more musical than grand pianos, which emit 88 frequencies. And the electron shell of the carbon atom produces the same harmonic scale as the Gregorian chant. So when Revelation 5.13 says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. This is not a future tense prophecy. It is a present tense reality. We just can't hear it. Now the day is going to come when we get a glorified body. Yes? Come, are you looking forward to that? I don't know what, you know, if, if it's the abs that you're most looking forward to. Um, you know, I have no idea. But you know what I'm looking forward to? The, the five glorified senses. Because we're going to see colors that, that we can't perceive right, right now. It's trichomats. We can only uh, see about 10 million colors. But the day is going to come uh, when we cross that space-time. We're going to see things. They're going to blow our mind. And by the way, we're going to have glorified eardrums that are going to enable us, I believe, to hear angel octaves. And it's going to be awesome. And so when Scripture talks about mountains singing or trees clapping, I don't think it's just metaphorical. It's bioacoustical. Creation is God's song. He sang every atom into existence and every atom echoes that song back to God. Creation is a call and response. Now let me share a little bit about this first idea that God is bigger than big. And I want to be careful here because I've talked about this before and I don't want to go over old ground. Um, and so let me give you the short version. Now, according to the Doppler effect, the universe is still expanding. Uh, and you've got to understand, I mean, 100 years ago, th this was a novel thought. It wasn't until January 1st, 1925, Edwin Hubble is speaking to the American Astronomical Society, and he proposes this, this kind of counterintuitive idea um, based on uh, some evidence he found looking through some telescopes that the degree of redshift observed in light coming from other galaxies increased in proportion to the distance of that galaxy from the Milky Way. Uh, translation. The earth is expanding. And we have now, uh, astrophysicists, I think the latest estimate I've heard is about 93 billion light years across. This is a tremendous distance. And, and it all comes from four words. Let there be light. And those four words are still creating galaxies at the outer edges of the universe. And if God can do that with four words, what are we worried about? His voice. I don't have time to talk about it, but his voice. You see, we hear the word said and we think phonics. No, no, no. Think physics. Sound is first and foremost a form of energy. We use our voices to speak. God uses his voice to create, to heal to convict, to reveal. He speaks in frequencies that are way beyond our ability to hear. And we'll just leave it right there. Now let me have a little bit of fun with this. Now I want to do this a little different way this weekend. I want to show you a few slides. I think in the first one, if we can put it up, uh, in the first one, um, I just want to do a little... Uh, 
astronomy lesson in terms of the, the size of the earth. Now, the earth is larger than Mars or Mer- Mercury or, or the moon. Um, but then the second slide, uh, you'll see that we're smaller than Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, or Jupiter. Okay, you still with me? I think if we go to the next slide, you know, Jupiter, which is 1,321 times larger than the earth in terms of volume, is 10 times smaller than the sun. Okay, but the sun, it's a small star. It's a yellow dwarf star. And so I think, I don't know what slide we're on now, but maybe the fourth one. Uh, Arcturus, which is an orange giant, is 10 times bigger than the sun and produces 180 times more energy. And finally, last slide, uh, Antares is a red supergiant, and it is 10,000 times brighter than the sun. So here's the crazy thing. I don't know. We think the earth is pretty big. I mean, it is 24,759 miles in, in, in circumference, and that's impressive. And by the way, God tells Adam and Eve, fill the earth and subdue it. I think this planet is God's gift to us, and how we steward it is a gift back to God. And, uh, but, but my point is that we're, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things, and the universe is pretty Big, 93 billion light years across. And God says in Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So here's my thought. Your best thought on your best day is 93 billion light years short of how good and how great God really is. God is bigger than big. But God isn't just great. Because nothing is too big. I think God is great because nothing is too small. Psalm 36 says it this way in the message. His love is meteoric. His loyalty, astronomic. His purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largest, nothing gets lost. And that brings us to our second point. God is bigger than big. He's transcendent. And come on. He exists outside of these four space-time dimensions that we live in. We have a hard time imagining a fifth dimension. We don't get, when the Bible says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day, that makes no sense if you're existing in one time dimension. God does not live within the creation. that He, he is outside of time. He is outside of space. And if you put four-dimensional limits on God, you're in trouble because now, now you're anthropomorphizing God. Now, instead of letting God create you in his image, now you're creating God in your image. God is bigger than big, and God is closer than close. And I think this this second point needs to closely follow from the first point. I don't know, bigger than big, a little intimidating, isn't it? But closer than close, I can wrap my arms around that. In Genesis 1, before God even says, let there be light, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. And it's the first revelation of who the Holy Spirit is. Now, please catch this. Before the Holy Spirit fills or stirs or gifts or convicts or reminds or reveals all of these different functions of the Holy Spirit, first of all, he hovers. He hovers. Over the surface of the deep. It's the Hebrew word panim. It's multidimensional. In regard to time, panim refers to the split second before and the split second after. Think of it as a parenthesis in time. And in regard to space, panim refers to the place right in front and the place right in back. And so it is a parenthesis in space. In quantum mechanics, the shortest possible time is Planck time, 5.4 times 10 to the negative 44th power. Anything shorter is simultaneous. And the shortest distance is Planck length, 6.4 times 10 to the negative 34th 
power. And anything shorter. And quantum mechanics can't distinguish between here and there. Okay, which brings us back to this word panim. Now, the, the psalmist paints the picture this way. It's so beautiful. The psalmist says, you hem me in behind and before. In other words, you're closer than close. Yes, God is bigger than big, but he is also closer and close. And I love the way A.W. Tozer said it. God is above, but he's not pushed up. He's beneath, but he's not pressed down. He's outside, but he's not excluded. He's inside, but he's not confined. God is above all things presiding, beneath all things sustaining, outside all things embracing, and inside all things filling. That is the imminence of God. God is 5.4 times 10 to the negative 44th power before and after. God is 6.4 times 10 to the negative 34th power ahead and behind. He is God with, 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 with us. He is the friend who sticks closer, closer, closer than a brother. He will never leave us nor forsake us. I want you to hear something today. He is hovering over the chaos of your life. The way he hovered over the surface of the deep. And he's the God who wants to bring order out of that chaos. And bring beauty and symmetry out of those things that seem formless and void. I have to share this. I'm going to cheat a little bit and touch on chapter 2. I love to talk about the first blessing right? Or the first breath. But let me talk about the first breath for just a moment. Do you remember that God breathes into this dust bowl and names him Adam? 223 days ago, God healed my asthma. And I'll tell you what happened. The week after, I started reading everything I could get my hands on, books about oxygen, books about respiration, books about breath. And I, and I stumbled across something I, I hadn't known in, in all of the seminary um, classes I've taken over the years never stumbled across this somehow. <sighs> Hebrew scholars believe that the name of God, Yahweh, without the vowels, is synonymous with the sound of breathing. So on one hand, it's too sacred to be pronounced. And on the other hand, It's the very first thing you said. It's your first word. It's your last word. We take about 23,000 breaths a day. And maybe, just maybe, we are whispering the name of God. In him we live and move and have our being. He's as close as our breath. Now, the psalmist echoes the second verse of Genesis. Uh, stick with me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. And the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. The psalmist asks an opening question. Where can I go from your spirit? The answer is nowhere because God is everywhere. We're already in the presence of God, says Richard Rohr. What's absent is awareness. Yes. Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist, had a little sign over his door. It was in Latin, but I'll translate it to English. It said, bidden or not, God is here. He's closer close. Revelation 3.20 says that he stands at the door and he knocks. There's been a moment in your life where you've heard the knock on the door of your heart. But you have to open the door. 
You have to invite him in. I pray you would do that. Let me close with this. In Genesis 1.26, God says, let us, let us make man in our, our image. It's plural. Fascinating, right? Even in the first chapter of Genesis, you have Father, Son, and Spirit. Now we know what the Spirit's doing, right? Hovering. But who's speaking? Who is saying, let there be light? Well, I I think uh, the Apostle John answers that question. Because John 1 and Genesis 1, you need to juxtapose those two scriptures. It's no coincidence that John begins his gospel in the beginning. It harkens back to Genesis 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Yes, the flesh, uh, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, John 1.14, in a town called Bethlehem that we celebrate at Christmas. He was in the beginning. He was the word speaking all things into creation. I love the way Louis Giglio says this. He says there is no B.C. I mean, I know we divide our calendar. B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord? No. Not theologically. In Genesis, he's the creator. In Exodus, he's the deliverer. In Leviticus, he's the Passover lamb. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In the Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Isaiah, he's wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fire. In Nahum, he's the stronghold in the day of trouble. In Haggai, he is our signet ring. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. I can't not share this. Today, today, got an email. Three weeks ago, Laura and Nina are in some refugee camps in Greece. I told you that. Uh, My wife, Laura, um, told me about this little boy that she prayed for named Job who was blind in his left eye. Not anymore. We just heard today. He has sight in his left eye. Listen, my only explanation for that is that there is a God who is bigger than big There's a God who is closer than close. He did it before and he can do it again. I'm going to share one last thought. We should never read 2 Corinthians 5.17 the same way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Until you have an understanding of what God did day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then day seven. You haven't even begun to understand what God is capable of doing in your life. There is nothing he cannot heal. There is nothing he cannot restore. Listen, just as I have scars on my body, I have scars all over my body. Got about a dozen scars on my knees. About seven different surgeries. Arthroscopic, reconstructive. Then when my intestines ruptured, they they had to open me up and close me back back up. About a 15-inch scar right down the middle of my abdomen. I got crazy scars. I remember a a suitcase I opened when I was a kid. I still have the scar right here. Um, And then I got a few pock marks from uh, chicken pox. I got scars all over the place. But you know what? Those scars are a reminder of the healing that's taken place. 
I'll be honest, I used to be a little embarrassed, you know, right after when that scar was just, ah, not a, not a pretty sight. It's a little better now, it blended a little bit. I used to be kind of embarrassed by it. Now I look at it. I should be dead. I should have died on that operating table. I was on a respirator for two days. Ah, it's a beautiful scar. It's evidence that the Lord healed me and raised me back up. I know your life isn't perfect. I know your marriage has its issues. I know you're struggling with this and that and the other thing. But you are a new creation in Christ. You invite him in and you let him do what he does. Let there be light. Father, thank you. We bless you. And we invite you right now into our hearts, into our lives. God, we thank you at the beginning of this journey what you're gonna do. Thank you that you invite us to be a part of the story that you're writing. And God, you tell amazing stories. And so we step into that story. Lord, I pray for the person that right now has never made that decision to put their full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that they would do it right here, right now, that they would open the door and invite you into their heart. In Jesus' name, amen.